This is Andrew Whitehead talking to John Saville in Hull on the 12th of January 1993. You joined the Communist Party in 1934. Why? Late autumn. The obvious political party, I think, uh, all the intelligent people that I knew, with one or two exceptions, like Alec Nove, the professor of Russian history at Glasgow, were in the CP. I wasn't especially political when I went to LSE, but it seemed a fairly natural thing to do. The arguments and the reading I took to very easily. So you joined what in your first term as a student? Yes, um, after about two months. How big was the party branch in the LSE then? I can't remember, but it probably was about 30 or 40. I should think at its peak, it may have got up to somewhere between 80 and 100. And its peak would be, oh, 35, 36, 37. But when you joined in 34, the CP was still rather unfashionable. It was coming out of the class against class period. We weren't yet into the popular front phase, which came a year or two later. What was the intellectual attraction of the CPGB? Well, uh, they had moved from the class against class and in fact, people of my generation who joined the CP and those who came after me knew nothing, or almost nothing, of the history of the CP and the class against class episode, period, the third period as it's called, uh, was, not, uh, was not known at all. And most people from certainly 34 onwards took a more or less united front line, which was already coming into political uh, life uh, on the left. So it is very important to appreciate that the most of the people who became communists in the 30s did not know about the sectarianism of the 29-32 period. But how sectarian was the party even so in that period, in the mid-30s, when the Labour Party, after all, the bulk of the Labour Party, wanted nothing to do with the CP? No, in terms of students, we were not sectarian, uh, and we always worked with social democratic uh, students. I don't recall any problem of uh, this kind, because you must remember that early in 1935, the French... Had a, was, were already establishing a united front against their own against their own fascists. The Soviet Union joined the League of Nations in the spring of uh, 1935, and then, of course, at uh, the end in August of 1935, came the Seventh World Congress. So my introduction to the Communist Party was one in which the united front was already well underway, and within a year. The Seventh World Congress had, of course, adopted a much more flexible and indeed sensible line uh, towards uh, working with other sections of the labour movement. But 1935 was also the year which the CPGB adopted a uh, policy programme entitled, I think... For, for, a Soviet for a Soviet Britain. Britain. Which, which was positing the Soviet model, a revolutionary road rather than a democratic road. Was that the way in which young communists saw the future? Mm, it was a ridiculous title. And, uh, as you say, or as you indicate, was quite out of keeping with, in fact, the practical politics that we ourselves were uh, involved in. The answer about the Soviet Union is that, of course, the general attitude and approach towards the Soviet Union was that socialism was going to be built or was being built in the Soviet Union, whether it would follow the Soviet pattern, since the title of that pamphlet was very soon discarded, was, I think, an open question. Much more important for us uh, were journals such as Left Review, which was an extremely important influence, and, of course, the writings of people like Maurice Taub, and, in particular, Labour Monthly. Labour Monthly, which had mo uh, Notes of the Month by Palm Dutt, and which, historically speaking, I think, is the only intellectual journal which has been read seriously by large numbers of working-class militants. You mentioned Palm Dutt. Virtually everybody I talked to about Palm Dutt 
is less than complimentary about his personality, about the rigour with which he held to communist dogma. What are your feelings about him both at the time when you were reading his notes of the month and more particularly in retrospect? In the 1930s, there's no doubt at all that Palm Dutt's notes of the month were the most seriously studied uh, statements of any of the communist leaders. Everybody uh, read Palm Dutt and everybody argued about what they about what they read. Moreover, his book on world politics, which was published 1937 or 1938, probably, I think, 1937, published by the Left Book Club, was, uh, I think, an interesting book. It did not show the sort of intellectual uh, lack of rigour that uh, applied to his works in the post-war period and uh, had a very interesting and important influence upon us. The great thing about Palm Dutt uh, was that he showed you the interconnections on a world scale and the point I would make, I think, about the communist students of the 1930s was that the Communist Party instilled a sense of internationalism uh, in their members and certainly in the student members that uh, has remained with me at any rate uh, ever since. It's very important indeed the what pressed us in Brazil and what the resistant fighters in Greece um, what was happening in China all of these things were of major importance uh, in our general thinking and in our political attitudes and we were very far from taking a little England attitude in general. This is a bit of a stab in the dark but I know many of an earlier generation of, of communists uh, found one outlet of their internationalism in learning Esperanto. Was that ever the case at all with students? Oh the not at all, I think that had finished by the early 30s. Uh, it was, I think, important in the late twenties or during the twenties, but I never met anybody who uh, uh, was at all interested or who really raised the question, and certainly none of the students did. Coming back to Palm Dutt, um, there's no doubt uh, that uh, he was a very difficult person in in personal terms. Uh, there's no doubt, looking back to my mind, that the 30s was his most interesting period and his most uh, intellectually liveliest period. There's no doubt that in the post-war years his books lacked rigour, mainly, I think, because he felt there was nobody in the party who could, in fact, criticise and comment on them seriously, and I don't believe anybody, in fact, did. And the result is that while his post-war books, from 1945 onwards, uh, were based on quite serious research, they were badly structured, uh, and they ought to have been commented on uh, by uh, other historians and other economists, and they were not. The result is uh, that, uh, intellectually, he did not do himself justice. But of course, politically, and this is the most important thing about Dart, he was an ultra-Stalinist, and he had, in my view, a devastatingly unfortunate uh, influence upon, upon the CP. Even in the late 30s? Saying, I'm thinking of the about-turn debate. Well, yes. Of course. I mean, that that is clear in... Uh, in the minutes which have been published about the great debates in 39 over whether the war was an imperialist war or not. How important was Pollitt as a role model or as a charismatic leader to, to people in the LSE Communist Group? I think he was quite extraordinary. Uh, there was no uh, orator who touched Pollitt except uh, Nye Bevan, uh, and Pollitt, in some respects, I think, had the edge. He was a superb speaker. He was also a man of humanity, although there is no doubt either that he had to uh, tell lies uh, 
in the 1930s already about what was happening in the Soviet Union. The incident of Rose Cohen is, of course, well known. Um, but Pollitt, compared with Dart, I mean, was a human being. And uh, people liked him. Uh, he was a man who, in general, was trusted in a way that Dart, I think, was not. He was a man who was enormously liked, certainly, and that was not true of Dart. So Pollitt, for me, I mean, was a very attractive personality. Um, as a working-class militant, there was no one really uh, at that time or since that I can compare him with except Nye Bevan. And Nye Bevan intellectually uh, was, especially in the 1950s, of course, all over the place in a way that Pollitt himself wasn't. Pollitt, in the 50s, of course, became increasingly dogmatic. Um, he was getting older, but his great, his great period was uh, the, the 1930s, and in particular uh, the Spanish War period. Edward Thompson mentioned that some of his fellow communists at Cambridge actually had a portrait of Pollitt on their mantelpiece. <laughs> was that ever the case in London? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think. Uh, I, I don't think that kind of devotion ever uh, ever affected uh, me. I was enormously respectful of uh, Harry Pollitt. I knew him personally, but not very well, of course. I mean, I, after all, was only a student. I knew John Gollan much better and actually did some uh, uh, research work for Gollan for his book Youth in, in Modern Industry so I very often walked into um, walked into King Street and I saw Pollitt several times and talked with him and so on but he was a man I greatly respected and so did everybody else I think who came into contact with him In the LSE Communist Party group how many women among the members? Oh quite a lot um, I don't know the exact proportion, but they would certainly, I think, uh, um, be equal to the proportion of women in LSE as a whole. I would guess about a quarter to a third uh, women. Did the Communist Party then take sex equality seriously, or was it lip service? They would uh, certainly have accepted... Uh, uh, the equality of women as a socialist principle, uh, whether their practice uh, uh, was adjusted to a complete acceptance of sex equality is quite a different uh, matter. There were certainly some women that I can recall who took as leading a part in the discussions uh, as uh, the men. But I think it is fair to say that uh, it was mostly males uh, who took a leading part in the in the uh, debates and discussions within the party groups. And the, the party group at the LSE, what was its activity consisting of? Was it simply debates and discussions, or were there meetings, rallies, selling the daily worker, activities of that sort? Most of the activity of the of the party group was, uh, was their involvement uh, within uh, uh, LSE. Uh, of course, having said that, we always took our people out on the streets against uh, mostly fascists um, on all the major demonstrations um, so that while our political work was among our fellow students uh, um, both politically and intellectually and the intellectual side I think was as important uh, as uh, the uh, uh, political that is to say the discussion of Marxism um, at the same time, we, everyone was expected to, to be active in a practical way, and that in particular meant uh, taking part in the many demonstrations, and you must understand that there were many, many demonstrations uh, um, um, which involved London workers, uh, London anti-fascists uh, for Spain, and so on and so forth. So it was a very active and lively life. There was one major exception, and that is that uh, um, communist students were expected to be good students. Now, this is a slogan which has often been misunderstood. Um, there are some idiots, for example, uh, on the extreme left who've suggested that uh, 
After the 7th Congress of 1935, everybody dressed like bank clerks and were very respectable, and that, of course, is absolute rubbish uh, and nonsense. But uh, what a good student meant, as far as I was concerned, uh, was that you were good at your academic work on the general and sensible grounds that if you wanted, this was long before Gramsci, let me say, if you wanted uh, to uh, be able to debate on the level of bourgeois ideology and bourgeois ideologists, then you had to know what, they, what you were talking about. And it was this aspect uh, of being a good student, that is to say that you had to confront bourgeois ideologists on their own ground, at their own level, and you couldn't do that. Uh, if you were not intellectually sufficiently equipped. And for me, that was what a good student meant. And certainly, in the uh, party group, I don't know whether this happened at Cambridge or elsewhere, but in the party group uh, at LSE, uh, being a good student meant that however active you had been in your first two years, in your third year, you did absolutely no political work but you concentrated on your degree. So you didn't attend meetings, you didn't go to demonstrations, you did nothing? Well, the theory always uh, was frayed at the edges. That is to say, you did not necessarily have to attend party meetings, although I think you were probably expected to, uh, private meetings, that is, uh, uh, inside. But you were not expected to take an active part in the Socialist Society, which was by then a joint society of communists and uh, socialists. And you would not necessarily, I think, be criticised if you did not appear on a demonstration. I mean, in my case, for instance, I mean, I had done practically no academic work. I'd hardly written a single essay in my first two years. LEC was very slack in this kind of uh, respect, thank God. And um, I'd read an enormous amount. Um, and LEC was fortunate in having uh, nearly half its students postgraduates with whom you ate every day. And the intellectual discussion was, was at a high level for, uh, for a university. Um, having seen a lot of university or heard a lot of university discussions in my last uh, f uh, 40 years or so. Um, but in my case, um, I worked something like 10 hours a day uh, on academic work um, until Easter, and then I worked 12 hours a day. And uh, working for my finals took up my whole life um, all my time, except the fact that uh, the woman I was to marry came up as a first-year student in my last year, and I used to we used to walk around Lincoln's Inn Fields, um, and occasionally later on in the year go away for weekends. But that was my only um, removal, as it were, from my general commitment to getting a good degree, and I did in my year. I think four out of seven firsts were communists. But that suggests that the party organisation was very disciplined. If you require to be excused, almost formally excused from attending meetings, it suggests a fairly iron discipline, a fairly strong commitment to the party. Oh yes, that's right. There was. Yes, you, you were expected. Look, you were expected. Let, let us recognise that in any organisation um, of this kind, however committed the theory of course, behind it is. The fact is there are some people who will work very hard and there are some people who will work less hard. Um, and one has to take notice and accept that. Uh, but generally speaking, of course, uh, there was a reasonably high degree of discipline. But one mustn't, uh, one mustn't exaggerate it. I would have thought uh, that it was probably less uh, uh, strict and rigid than some of the post-war Trotsky's groups have been. Have you got any general impression about the social basis of your fellow communist students? Who they were? Where they came from? Well, they were different uh, in social background, or most of them were, from the communist students one knew at Cambridge and uh, Oxford. And one had a good deal of contact with, with both. In my case, uh, it was mainly Cambridge. I mean, I knew John Cornford quite well for 
example, um, and I knew Mohan Kumar Mangalam, the leading Indian communist who actually was one of the very few Indians to come out openly as a communist. But um, I've now forgotten what your question was. Social basis of... Oh, social basis, basis yes, of course. Uh, but the general, the general social composition of uh, LSE students was uh, um, petty bourgeois to middle middle class, I would think, with only one or two, uh, um, relatively few, from the top public schools, which was, of course was not true of either Cambridge or, uh, or Oxford. So, um, yes, middle to lower middle class, I would think. A few working class people. Quite a high proportion compared with most places of Jewish students. And uh, this was really my first introduction to Jewish culture. Not only English uh, uh, Jewish students, of course, but the fact that uh, uh, England was taking a fairly liberal attitude towards uh, Jewish refugees, and there were quite a number of Jewish refugee students um, from Central Europe, and in particular, in particular from Germany. So this was a new dimension for me, this Jewish culture, and although it was a communist Jewish culture, nevertheless it was different uh, from anything that I had previously experienced and indeed was very important for me. The other, the other um, uh, component of the student body that was important were the Americans. And I was uh, very close to a number of Americans, postgraduate students these were, practically no undergraduates. Uh, but as I had said earlier, uh, the great thing about LEC was the way in which um, everybody ate together, the postgraduates and uh, the undergraduates, and the, the level of intellectual discussion was, uh, I think, uh, uh, very lively indeed. But in the 30s, in my 30s at any rate, from 34, the importance of the New Deal was considerable. And we all read radical literature from the States. This was partly encouraged, I think, by Harold Lasky, because for me, uh, the only uh, lecturer who had a really serious impact and influence upon me was Harold Lasky, who was a superb performer uh, at the, uh, uh, at the uh, Ross, on the rostrum, and uh, um, he was the only one whose lectures I went to for every one of three years. You mentioned John Cornford. He's become something of a legend following his early death. Uh, his writings about him re republished not all that long ago, a volume in tribute to him. What was he like? What was your impression of him at the time? Well, I think you'll probably get the best uh, account of uh, John Cornford in the memoir that was published soon after his death, uh, edited, I think, by Pat Sloan, uh, and uh, the essay by Victor Kiernan, who knew uh, Cornford very well. I met him, of course, a number of times. He was a very lively chap. I didn't pick him out as anybody uh, uh, very special. Um, he was just one of the best students, of course, around, but there were a lot of very good people around, very lively. And John, who was big, with dark hair, full of energy and so on, was impressive, but uh, there were other people who, in my view, were as impressive. It's only later that I, when I came to read some of his writings, that I realised how extraordinarily, uh, um, how extraordinarily bright, uh, intellectually bright he was. After the LSE, you became London student organiser for the Communist Party, which... Only for a year... Yes. And how, how much tied in were you then to the CPGB bureaucracy? Well, not very much. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a full-time organiser called Jack Cohen, uh, who I think uh, became organiser, national organiser of the students, and whose uh, biographical entry will be found in Volume 9 of the Dictionary of Labour Biography. 
Um, Jack, uh, working class, Jewish bloke from Manchester, uh, poor family, uh, an extraordinarily nice man. I think these were probably his most interesting years. He, uh, he was just the right chap for uh, the students and uh, did a very good organising job. And uh, my contact with the what you call the bureaucracy was very largely through Jack Cohen, who was the, nas- who was the party's national organiser. Um, I didn't really have much to do with, uh, with King Street. I used to drop in, but that was all. Jumping ahead just a, a touch to the about turn, did that worry you at the time? No, it didn't, actually. Um, mainly, curiously enough, because I was less involved in politics at that particular period than I had been uh, through the whole decade. Uh, when I graduated... I was unemployed for some six months, and I worked for the, in a voluntary capacity for the Union of Democratic Control in Victoria Street, uh, and up above uh, our offices were the offices of uh, Claude Coburn, uh, who edited The Week. Um, then I got a job as Assistant Secretary to the Dictaphone Company um, at the salary of three pounds ten shillings a week, three fifty, and I stayed there for about a year, and then I got a job at five pounds a week as a research economist with the British Home Stores. Uh, this was in the spring of 1939, and very sensibly uh, they said, "There's no point in you coming into head office until you know something about." British Home Stores, so you will in fact go through every grade that there is. So I started and worked a fortnight as a porter, and it nearly killed me, physically speaking. And then I went on the floor, and I went to seaside stores and so on. And um, at the time uh, uh, of the change of line, I was actually in the northeast, uh, working... In a, to open a new store, I think in Sunderland, when I was extremely hard worked and I had n- no contact with the party group um, and I was entirely on my own uh, and just working and dead tired at the end of a day and just flopped into bed. So that in that period when everybody was madly discussing the change of line in my case all I was doing was working for the British Home Stores and that carried on until Christmas and then I came to London but by and large I accepted the change of line I have to say largely I think because I like everybody I suppose I never trusted the Chamberlain government and by the time I got back to London of course the Finnish war was in fact beginning to get underway and the possibility of British military and British and French military intervention was of course uh, very much on the agenda Um, and a shift of the war from Germany to the Soviet Union was well in the interest of a significant minority of of the Tory party and of uh, the upper classes. Moving back a bit to your involvement with Indian students, how did that come about? Not, uh, not really. Uh, before 1939, we, mo- since the Indian Communist Party was illegal, although we knew a number of Indian students at uh, LSE and in Cambridge, more in Cambridge, I think, than LSE, were members of the Communist Party. We were very careful not to expose them, um, and we had relatively little contact. Uh, and I think this must have been a deliberate decision, but I can't remember. We had relatively little uh, uh, contact with uh, Indian students, either in London or uh, in Cambridge. I knew Mohan Kumramangalam because he was an open communist, but there were very few uh, uh, like him, because if they'd become open and then gone back, they would have been arrested. So one had to be very careful. So my contact with Indian students was fairly minimal. But in the summer of thirty-eight, you were among those who attended a meeting which Nehru addressed. A, a oh yes, that's right. Uh, but that was Nehru talking to 
um, I suppose, mostly members of the uh, London district of the Communist Party. White members, that is to say. It wasn't a, a meeting for Indians. But this wasn't a public meeting. This was a private No, this was a private meeting, and it, I take it had been arranged through Palm Dutt. What did Nero say? He was talking about the situation uh, in India and the political situation. I remember I asked him a question about the differentiation uh, within the social strata or stratum of the peasantry. It was an economic, political uh, uh, account of India, and there was a general and open discussion with him. Would he be viewed by you that then at that time as a fellow traveller? Well, I don't think we use the word fellow traveller, uh, we would assume he was on the left, yes. Then you served in India during the war. From when? When did you arrive in India? Well, not until the last two years uh, of the war. I didn't. I left India in March, nineteen forty-six, um, and went therefore in forty-four. Uh, I got there. I don't know. Late summer forty-four. And you made contact with the party in Bombay. Oh, straight away. I carried letters from the uh, from King Street to uh, to um, to the party headquarters in Bombay. The party then being legal. Yes. And you were telling me that you spent two and a half months, more or less, working on behalf of the CPI in Bombay. Well, what happened was that, uh, and uh, I wasn't alone. There were many other English uh, 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 comrades who uh, did the same, and so did Americans, I may say. There were quite a lot of American uh, radicals who made contact with the American, with the Indian CP. But it was um, it was relatively easy for English communists uh, at all levels, uh, whatever your rank, that is to say, to make contact with, uh, uh, with uh, Indian communists uh, in Bombay or wherever you were stationed. There, there was usually no problem, and in my experience, a lot of people did this. Uh, I did it. I went straight, to, um, straight off the boat to the party headquarters, uh, in Bombay, and there, the first person I met was Mohan Kumaramangalam. So that was easy. I was introduced to the, as it were, top level of the, of the Indian Communist Party, and I got to know P. C. Joshi, and uh, all the other leading members of the central, of the central uh, the committee. I didn't stay in Bombay long on that occasion. I went to Karachi, and I made contact with the district a committee secretary uh, in Karachi, and wherever I went in India, when I since I was a gunnery instructor, I moved around quite a lot. Um, I made contact. Uh, the most important places were Bombay, Karachi and Pune. And uh, in the last six months before the war ended, the war with Japan that is, I was about a hundred miles from Pune and used to go into Pune most weekends and stay uh, with uh, some party comrades. Um, he, the man, worked, uh, he, he taught mathematics at Pune College, and his wife was a full-time organiser for women uh, for the Indian Party. Um, and they used, to, um, they used to give me a bed, which means I put up a mosquito net in the same room as they slept. This was a very difficult time for the CPI because their support for the war after yes. 41 made them deeply unpopular in India, at least yes. with their natural constituency. And then at the end of the war, the party was seriously divided about tactics and adopted the Ranadeva insurrectionary thesis, uh, which led to something close to tragedy at, in, in, in 48. Uh, well, when I was there, uh, they were not developing the insurrectionary thesis. The problem when I was there was the problem of the Muslim League and partition of India and so on. And this was where Dutt, of course, uh, got himself much involved in the internal discussions uh, in India since he did not agree in a number of ways with the, uh, with the leadership of the Indian Party. I thought P.C. Joshi was in, in an enormously attractive personality. Uh, he was, of course, deposed by the uh, more sectarian members of the Central Committee, Randy Vey and Adhikari, but I think that was a great, uh, uh, a great mistake. He, I think Joshi had, a very, had, had the common touch uh, 
and he really was a most attractive personality. He spoke well, but he was very warm, and they, that communicated. Um, and he, I think, was responsible, for, really, for building something of the basis of a mass party in the latter years of the war and in the immediate period after the war. What was the nature of the relationship between the CPGB and the CPI? Well, I don't know what it was formally, there's no doubt. Uh, it may well have been that the Comintern, and I think did, yes, I think the Comintern did, in fact, uh, make Britain, as it were, quote-unquote, responsible. Uh, the Communist parties always had, in the, in the colonial countries, Communist parties always had some kind of outside uh, uh, reference. Well, I think the, Indi the British Party always had that. After all, in the 20s, it had sent people into India. Um, and, of course, three of them were at the famous Merritt trial from 1929 to 1932. But because he'd written this famous book, Modern uh, uh, India Today, Dutt was regarded as one of the great commentary and experts and uh, was certainly taken seriously by um, the Indian party members. Though that, of course, was not Indian himself. He was of Indian origin, but not Indian born. Well, he was half Swedish, half Indian. Was there some resentment about the role that Palm Dutt took upon himself of being the communist ideologist for India? Well, I think he... Uh, wait a moment. I'm not sure that he... I suppose he took it upon himself. Uh, you must also understand uh, that one of the things the Communist Party did between the wars uh, was in fact to put imperialism, anti-imperialism on the agenda. And this is very important, considering the jingoism, of course, that there was, uh, as there still is, um, to a lesser extent, about empire. Uh, now, the Communist Party was not alone people like H.N. Brailsford, who was the greatest socialist journalist of the interwar years, the ILP. Uh, the left of the labour movement was always anti-imperialist, but the communists played, I, in my view, an honourable part in the development of an anti-imperialist consciousness, so that, uh, and that was very important in this. Um, the British Communist Party had Dutt as a considerable expert on India. I mean, I'm not talking about whether he was right or wrong on this issue or that issue, but he knew a great deal about it. They did not have anything like the same kind of expertise on Africa, which the Labour Party did. The Labour Party uh, Advisory Committee on International Affairs had a number of quite important uh, Africanists uh, on, their, uh, on their committee, and they were people like Norman Lays, and they were very uh, important indeed. Um, so I'm not suggesting that it was only the Communist Party that developed this anti-imperialist consciousness, far from that, but they were an important component. Good. In chat earlier, I, was, I mentioned to you what Ralph Russell had told me, that CPGB-trained Indian communists came back to India, he said, and were quite unjustly promoted straight away to the top of the party, the CPI. Yes, well, I don't believe that. From my experience of the Central Committee of the, uh, of the CPI, the Communist Party of India, uh, when I got there in um, the autumn of... 1944 and went to the party headquarters and I met most of the central committee as far as I recall there were only two and these were the youngest members of the committee Mohan Kumaramangalam and one other whose name for the moment escapes me uh, who had been uh, who'd been educated in England I mean trained I think is too strong a word who'd been educated in England. I mean, my uncle from England went to Eton before he went to Cambridge. Um, most Indians who came, of course, uh, they didn't go to school in England. They, they came straight from India to a university in, uh, in England, either Oxford, Cambridge or, or uh, London. Um, so trained is not, I think, the right word. Trained is not the right word for my uncle from England. We trained himself within the context of the Cambridge uh, communist uh, uh, groupings. And, uh, but coming back to Bombay, as I was saying, I don't think 
uh, Georgie Russell's right, because uh, none of the uh, Central Committee, except these two, uh, were uh, intellectuals from abroad. Some of them were intellectuals, but as far as I know, they'd been in India the whole time. Talking about the CPGB, you've talked about the importance of its anti-fascist activity, of its anti-imperialist uh, arguments. What you haven't talked about is the, the class perspective. How strong was the class perspective? Oh, very strong. Oh, yes. I mean, what I, what I got from my uh, time as a student and afterwards in the 30s were two things. One is uh, I totally distrusted the uh, English ruling, the British ruling classes, and that's remained with me ever since. And secondly, I was deeply sceptical about the Labour Party leadership, and that too has remained with me ever since. But certainly a class, there's no question, uh, of course, about the, um, the wickedness of the British ruling class in the 1930s, uh, their non-intervention policy in Spain, which undoubtedly, in my view, was a major factor in the defeat of the, of the Republic. I think it's, uh, it's usually underestimated as to what uh, uh, they did. Their appeasement policy was something which they genuinely uh, believed in because of their anti-Bolshevism and anti-communist uh, line. And the ruling classes generally apart from their social and domestic policies, with which, again, I totally, of course, uh, disagreed, uh, the, uh, the ruling classes, for me, I mean, became the, uh, the enemy of decency, of progress, um, and that, as I say, has remained with me ever since. And how much... I, uh, are you suggesting that in some way or other, that in the Popular Front days, the Communist Party played down class? Because if you are, I don't believe it's true. No, I'm not suggesting that. I'm asking you. <laughs> my, my purpose is to ask, not to suggest. But how much was the party's activity working class oriented? Oh, totally. Of course. I mean, we all thought that the working class were clearly the most important. And if you look at the composition of, uh, uh, of the... Um, people who figure most, say, in the Daily Worker or in the party's publications. It's the miners, it's the engineers, um, it's, to a lesser extent, the textile workers, but it's working-class people and working-class militants. It's people like uh, Horner, Arthur Horner of the South Wales Miners. It's uh, people like uh, Leo McGree of the, on Merseyside. Uh, it's people like Joe Scott. These are the names that come up again and again uh, when you're talking about party policy. There's no question about the emphasis upon working class militancy. Taking another jump, the CP Historians Group, with hindsight, it seems to have operated as an internal opposition. Was, was there any semblance of that at the time? No. It's, it's not true it operated as an internal opposition. It's true that uh, it became exceedingly sceptical and was a centre of opposition in 1956. But before that, people in the historians group were ordinary Communist Party members and did their own job. But what were the ant antecedents of that antipathy? I mean, when did unease become something more than that? I mean, you'd survived uh, the Jewish doctors, Slansky, all those other debacles... When did people start to get really worried and talk to each other privately about their fears and concerns? Oh, not, I think, until 56. I speak for myself. After all, uh, whatever one's private worries were, and they were, they were there. For example, James Klugman's From Trotsky to Tito was a book that I thought was terrible. Uh, I didn't believe it. Uh, and there were other things that worried me. I mean, I didn't accept uh, the uh, cultural nonsense of, uh, 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 of uh, Zdanov, um, and I didn't believe uh, in the genetic controversy. Um, but these were, for me, comparatively minor things. I'm not trying to dismiss them, but I'm saying that by comparison with what, in fact, the Western powers were doing, 
uh, culminating in the Korean War um, and in the Empire generally, uh, in Mau Mau, for example, in, in Kenya, um, for me, there is no question at all that um, on, in the balance that one always has to make in politics, if you take decisions, there was no question in my mind that, the, uh, that one had to be against the Labour governments after 1945 and the Tory governments after 1951, and this was the overriding, uh, this was the overriding consideration. This was our country, and these were the things that we were doing. Um, and uh, whatever one felt about the Soviet Union, and I was not totally starry-eyed by any means, except on one issue. I didn't believe in anti-Semitism, and I was wrong. Uh, I did not believe in anti-Semitism, mainly because I had a lot of very good Jewish friends, some of whom had come from Russia, um, and who read Russian regularly, and who gave no indication to me at all uh, of anti-Semitism uh, in the Soviet Union. And I was prepared to believe them rather than the bourgeois press. And I was wrong. How uncomfortable was it, perhaps for you personally, being a communist oh, during the Cold War? Oh, well, fairly difficult. I, I don't think... I did quite a lot of open-air speaking in Hull uh, in the early 50s. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt that the Korean War period was the most difficult period of the Cold War uh, for communists. Uh, there was a great deal of jingoism. I mean, people really got uh, uh, hysterical at the beginning of the... Uh, at the beginning of the uh, Korean War. If you read, uh, as I've just done, a biography of uh, Simone de Beauvoir, for example, the point is made there that she believed a world war was a likely uh, possibility. It was a very uh, high spot or low spot, however you define it, in We were talking about. We were talking about difficulties of being a communist in in the Cold War. Period. Oh yes, uh, and I was saying that uh, it was a much more difficult period than uh, than people uh, often believe. Uh, there were various there were various points to be made. The first is that no communist could possibly get a job. I mean, even somebody as decent as G. D. H. Cole, when he wrote uh, uh, references for people, uh, would give a very accurate and often glowing account of the individual concern. But he would also add at the bottom of his letter, at least this happens in one letter that I've seen, um, I have to say that this man is a that this man is a communist. As far as I'm concerned, that would make absolutely no difference to my uh, 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 appointing him to this particular job, and I do, in fact, recommend him most warmly. But he also knew that by saying that, he would almost certainly I'm afraid, bar the person from any job. I'm afraid so, yes. So he was playing along with a touch of McCarthy as well? Well, I, yes. Uh, it's amazing how much it affected people. And, and G.D.H. Cole was a man of principle. Uh, but the, I've seen one letter only, and that, that was enough. The most interesting, uh, um, but I mean, there was a great deal of this that went on on the telephone that you can't, of course, record. But Victor Kiernan has a very nice story. Victor Kiernan had a fellowship at Trinity, which um, a five-year uh, fellowship, which involved travel abroad uh, for one year, and he, after two years in England, he went abroad namely to India, and, stay and got caught and stayed there seven years. When it came back, Trinity gave him his remaining two years. And um, he tried, of course, to get jobs. Uh, and um, his tutor wrote a testimonial for a job at Oxford, which uh, Victor later saw, which said, on no account should you appoint this man, he's a Marxist, and so on. Uh, and uh, the same tutor wrote a testimonial for the University of Edinburgh in which he gave a glowing picture of Victor and Victor got the job.
The man in question was the former, now dead, uh, uh, soi-disant liberal, uh, conservative, um, um, I've forgotten, but I'll remember it later. But that sort of thing went on. And, uh, of course, George Ruday, who's just died today, or died uh, a few days ago, um, was a victim of this. Uh, Alfred Cobbon at the University College London um, deliberately, of course, uh, uh, made certain that he never got an academic posting in, uh, in England, and George had to go to Australia for his first academic uh, job. But there are other examples that I could quote uh, of people who couldn't get jobs. Mind you, there weren't very many academic jobs. And it may well be, of course, that uh, some people, uh, you know, uh, who were not appointed were in fact beaten by better people at the day of the interview. But looking at that talent within the CP Historians Group, it's quite amazing the number of people who came to be major, powerful intellectual forces, remain powerful intellectual forces in Britain were in the CP Historians Group in the late 40s and the 50s. Yes, it is, isn't it? But why? What do you think is the reason for that? <laughs> I have no idea. Yes, I can see the intellectual attraction of communism in the late 30s. What is, is, is more opaque is the attraction of communism to young intellectuals in the late 40s and early 50s. Well, look, I think what you have to appreciate is that um, most of the historians Historians in the historians group became communists in the 30s. The war experience, whatever their experiences in particular were, confirmed them in their general view of the British ruling class, the British class system, uh, and of the way the world was going. And similarly, the wholly reactionary foreign policy which uh, Ernest Bevin followed from the day he entered office uh, and the reactionary role that Britain played in conjunction and in connection with uh, the United States uh, of uh, America confirmed us all, I think, in that whatever the problems inside the Soviet Union, the fact is our side uh, was in fact pursuing these very reactionary and illiberal policies, particularly with regard to the empire. And it's interesting that the members of the historians group had been through the experience of the late 30s, the war years, and the early, and the late 40s and the early 50s, and none of them, as far as I know, uh, um, ratted. All of them remained. Now, when they left in 1956, they may not all have remained politically in the same exactly in the same way, but they all, they all have remained, it seems to me, as far as I know, uh, on the left. But why it, it was uh, such a, a, a lively intellectual group, why the individuals concerned were, were so intellectually lively, um, I have no idea, except that the Communist Party did attract, um, you know, not all the intelligent people of the 1930s. Of course, that would be ridiculous to say that, but certainly a significant proportion. Isn't that it? You tell me. <laughs> but let's have a, a roll call of the historians group. There was yourself, uh, Eric Hobsbawm, who remained in the party. Uh, yes, but Eric remained in the party as uh, an iconoclast. I mean, he never, he never went back on what he thought was a principal position. You've only got to read, for example, a New Left Review, Eric's own review of um, James Klugman's History of the Communist Party to realise that, you know, Eric uh, was an honest man. I mean, he said what he really believed. Right? Yes, I entirely accept that. But, I mean, who else was there? Christopher Hill, Dorothy Thompson, to a lesser extent, Edward Thompson. Well, uh, when you say to a lesser extent, that's only because I earlier pointed out that Edward was less prominent in the historian's group than, uh, than Dorothy. Uh, it may well have been, may I just make the point, um, because he was teaching history, remember. He wasn't teaching literature. He was teaching history, but A, 
he was on the Yorkshire district of the Communist Party, B, he was running their journal, uh, and uh, C, they had... Uh, did they have children? I can't remember. Um, but he was very busy, um, particularly in the evenings, because he was an adult tutor and had to go all over the place. But so it was Dorothy who came to London, uh, or wherever, usually London, uh, for the uh, for the meetings, um, Edward did, but I don't think he took a, as I say, a particularly prominent uh, part, whereas Dorothy did. Then we also have Royden Harrison, Leslie Morton, Victor Kiernan. Ralph Samuel was probably too young, was he? Well, Ralph uh, uh, was the only student, I think, at the famous week we had, the whole week uh, of discussions at Netherwood. Uh, um, in uh, Hastings in 55 yeah he came he was a schoolboy or you know 18 year old or whatever I think before he went up to uh, before he went up to uh, Oxford uh, but he but in that I mean he was just very precocious and very and um, very unusual um, George Ruday uh, Ken Andrews Ken Andrews who in fact uh, uh, was important uh, he was, was a 16th century, 17th century historian, uh, but who, uh, um, after about 1960, I think, uh, uh, didn't become anti-communist, but just uh, became neutral in in politics. Alan Merson, by the way, he remained in the uh, Communist Party, um, and he was a 17th century historian. 56, and the secret speech. When did you hear about it? Well, I, I don't know. I read about it, I suppose, when it first broke in the Observer or Sunday Times. Observer, was it? Um, and um, it was soon after that that it became clear that there was a great deal to it, that it wasn't just a propaganda stunt, as I suppose I thought it was immediately. I can't remember. Um, and uh, it was at the uh, first historian's meeting in March, April 1956, it was the first one anyhow, that we began raising serious questions about the way in which King Street, the party bureaucracy, were in fact uh, treating and meeting uh, the uh, problem of the of the secret speech, and then it became clear, of course, with additional evidence that there was ferment over the speech in lots of uh, uh, communist parties, particularly the American CP. American CP was very important in this context, uh, not least because of the Jewish aspect uh, of uh, the uh, oppression inside uh, the Soviet Union. When you said the first meeting of the historian's group, you mean the first meeting after the secret speech? I mean the first meeting after the, uh, uh, yes. And certainly I was uh, very active was in, in speaking about it, but uh, you would have to get the minutes, which I haven't got, uh, of uh, that meeting, and they can, they can be got, as I've told you. How did you move from that open, or increasingly open, dissatisfaction with King Street to... Breaking the rules and publishing the reasoner. Well, because we were finding it difficult, and uh, not only ourselves individually, uh, finding it difficult to get material published in the party press. And this was the first time that we'd ever experienced, of course, censorship of this sort. And it surprised us, and indeed began to appall us, that you couldn't have a democratic discussion. And uh, when Edward and I... Uh, made contact with each other and it was fairly late that we did this uh, we found our experiences to be the same and we also had lots of other contacts who were who were writing and talking to us of course at the same at the same time and in my case of course there was always uh, the Jewish uh, 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 contact with uh, Shimon Abramsky and his group in London and that uh, together with the New York ferment and comments that were coming from New York um, I think uh, kept the thing boiling and uh, very hard indeed. And the Reasoner is a title borrowed from a paper of Holyoke isn't it? Yes. That was, I, think it, I think it was my idea. 
how was it? Now, we, we were very worried about this, Edward was, because Holyoke had somewhat anti-Semitic uh, uh, attitudes uh, and um, he, it was he who mentioned it and it was I who perhaps, I don't know, I mean I may be exaggerating, bulldoze, bulldoze the name through, just like the Socialist Register was my idea coming from uh, Cobbett. How was the first issue of the reason physically put together? Well, uh, all the issues were put together in the same way. Um, that is to say, Edward and I edited it um, and we agreed on what should go in. E Edward typed it, the whole lot. So, I mean, in some cases he would be typing 40 to 50 stencil sheets. And I had a business friend who ran a small business down by the docks. And he had a very old-fashioned gazette where you turn the handle. And the bloody thing always leaked uh, ink. Um, and gave up and gave you blotched copies. So the th I can remember the third issue. I would go. To, I had. A, I didn't have a car in those days. I had a bicycle, uh, and it's about two miles to the docks, I suppose, from from here. So I got on my bike every night and took took Edward's stencils, which he'd put on the train, and I'd collect them at the station. Um, and I'd run off 1,500 copies. This is the third issue. And I did that for a fortnight. And the last weekend, I worked on the Friday night until midnight. I worked all day Saturday. Um, right, no, not right through Saturday night. I went home Saturday night, worked all day Sunday, and worked right through Sunday night until 7 o'clock in the morning. Came home. It took me about three hours to clean up the office at the end. So what was your what was your print run, if that's the appropriate term? It probably isn't. Well, 1,500. Just 1,500 copies? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I turned, uh, I turned the handle. I say just 1,500 copies, but when you were thinking of all those pages, it was... Uh, it was a hell of a lot. I, it took me a fortnight and this last weekend. How did you distribute the first copy? Who did you send it to? I don't know. I've forgotten. Um... We had no problem uh, of getting it known and around. Um, we tried. I we tried to get it advertised in the Daily Worker, but failed. We were very careful about not talking to other left-wing journals. We were very anxious never not to do anything apart from publishing a journal which would allow the party bureaucracy. Uh, to uh, come down on us and expel us for a breach of this uh, particular regulation or that. Um, and we, we were quite sincere uh, in arguing and believing that we did not wish to leave the party. And it was only, I think, in the last two months that both of us, both Edward and myself, gradually came to the view that we were never going to shift the party uh, bureaucracy. You see, before the third issue was published, indeed just at the time the second issue was published, although the political bureau didn't know this, we were called up for a meeting early in September 1956, and we had a long meeting in the morning with, um, uh, with the political bureau, Harry Pollitt was there, John Golden was there, Dutt was there, and we were told to go away and come back in the afternoon with our answer as to whether we would in fact um, forego the publication of volume of number three. So Edward and I went away and uh, went back and said, no, we cannot give this. Uh, we think it's necessary. We will, however, give an assurance that when number three is published, we will not publish any more, at least for the time being. Were they satisfied with that assurance? No. Well, they said, uh, we hope you'll think about it. Uh, they were they were very civilised about it. They, nobody shouted at us. Um, there was no point. We'd have shouted back. Um, but once we published, and it came, um, of course, just at the time of Hungary, 
and we had to e we had to alter our editorial, which we did on the phone from this friend's office on the Sunday. And I had to retype it, I suppose, I can't remember, and then run it off. Um, and when it was published, then the party um, did not expel us, uh, but they um, suspended us. And at that point, Edwin and I, having talked it over, of course, um, decided that uh, we would resign. Do you think if it hadn't have been for Budapest, you might have stayed in the party? Uh, say that again. If it hadn't have been for Hungary, you might have stayed in the party. Oh, no. No, no. No, no. No, no. Uh, no, no. I mean, Hungary certainly was uh, an important factor, as it were, um, in supporting our general uh, opinions, but what we were concerned with was the absence of genuine democracy inside the party, which we'd always believed was in fact a democratic party. And um, moreover, um, and this is very important because many people get it wrong, that communists left the Communist Party because of Hungary. They didn't. They did, of course, but the whole thing started with... Um, a demand from uh, people like uh, Edward and myself that the party should tell the whole truth now about the Soviet Union and about socialism in the Soviet Union and what had gone wrong. That we would have no credibility, we said, with the uh, public, with ourselves or with the British public, with the Labour movement, unless we were prepared to say we were wrong. And this is what happened. And Hungary came on top of that, but Hungary was not the key question at all. The key question was what was happening in the uh, Soviet Union, according to Khrushchev, and why we had not been told this, and now we were told it, the party had to come clean. How Obviously, most of the historians' group left the party in '56, but among the rest of the party, how much support do you think you had? Oh, considerable. Um, it's, it's often, it was often said at the time that, of course, it was a matter of, of intellectuals, and that's not true. For one thing, Lawrence Daly uh, had, left, had left the party before we did, sometime in the summer of 1956, and he then got in touch with us after that. And we, of course, remained close to Lawrence Daly and helped him in his general election campaign in 1959. This is the Five Socialist League. That's right. We were very close to, uh, uh, to um, uh, Daly. Very. Most at, at the time, a most attractive personality. Brilliant speaker. Um, a serious uh, uh, working-class intellectual. Man who'd read an enormous amount and thought. He was a very attractive man. But... To answer your question, um, there were many, many people who left, workers, industrial workers, uh, of trade union officials, whose uh, uh, resignation was in fact never reported. For example, the fire brigade union, which I know something about because I've been helping uh, um, edit their recent history. Um, all, almost all the leading figures in the fire brigade union, John Horner, um, and his senior officials who were party members left but To what extent did these important trade union figures who left in '56 leave because of concern about inner party democracy to what extent were they using the divisions within the party as an excuse to abandon what seemed to be a sinking ship in political and industrial terms I don't think it was a sinking ship the uh, party in '56 had a very considerable industrial base it had a very active base uh, um, in localities. It wasn't a sinking ship. I don't believe that. It didn't, uh, it didn't sink for some time. It had a lot of, uh, of genuine industrial militants um, in groupings which have not been reproduced since. I mean, the Trotskyists have had a clear field since 1960 and they haven't made it, as we all know. Unfortunately, the, the kind of industrial militancy and militants that the Communist Party developed, trained, uh, and brought together uh, has not been repeated since the breakup. And uh, of that 8,000 or so who left, 
1956, a very large number were uh, uh, industrial workers and, uh, and or industrial militants. Um, of course, a lot of intellectuals left as well, but uh, it is incorrect, as I said earlier, to argue or to suggest that most of those who left in '56 were simply uh, intellectuals who didn't really know where they were going. You and Edward were at the fore of the of the those leaving the party in '56. Did you ever consider setting up a new organisation, a party, or some other? form of organisation which would be a new home to those who are leaving the CP? Well, naturally, one talked about this at great length. I personally never believed in the possibility of an independent party, um, and I was uh, never in favour of that. Uh, I was, I may say, uh, somewhat sceptical, much more than Edward, of the uh, new left clubs. Um, and I visited a number of them, and I was not happy with what I, with what I saw. Um, I don't think I understood in the way that I do now that uh, it was an historic breaking up, as it were, of a of a left, which unfortunately has not been reproduced since. And of course, one of the great tragedies of the present situation, as far as I'm concerned, is that there is no left of any significance, of any weight to the left of the Labour Party. There are quite lively groups, but they're nothing comparable to the position of the Communist Party in its heyday. You were approached, I think you were saying Edward was approached as well, but maybe it was just you, by the Socialist Labour League. Can you tell me the story of how they approached you? Well, they just came and talked uh, uh, um, to you or wrote to you. I mean, we had uh, one of their national organisers in the House for one uh, uh, evening, uh, it was, uh, it was, I think, expected uh, after we'd uh, resigned that uh, we should get this kind uh, of approach. And as I was telling you, I went down uh, on behalf of Edward and myself specifically to, uh, to talk with uh, Jerry Healy, which I did for three hours and came back and wrote a, um, a report to Edward in which I said I thought uh, uh, he was a bully. Uh, and uh, somebody that one really could not and should not associate with. What has been your personal political home since '56? Well, I've remained on the left. I remain a Marxist in intellectual terms. I take part in all the left movements that uh, that uh, uh, um, that have as it were, developed over the years. That is to say, I took a very active part in CND, and so did my wife. My wife went on every single Aldermaston march, um, and on the cross-country march from Hull to Liverpool. Um, I ran a, uh, uh, a debating forum for six or, six or seven years here in Hull every month. Um, I never refuse to speak on a left platform. I've tried to accept and adopt a non-sectarian attitude to movements uh, on the left, which in many ways I don't agree with. Um, the only exception to that is the what used to be the Workers' Revolutionary Party, the WRP, Jerry Healy's, uh, Jerry Healy's group. Um, and at the time of the... Uh, uh, Falklands War, I opposed it. At the time of the Gulf War, I went on a speaking tour uh, through the north of England uh, in opposition. Uh, at meetings which were organised by a variety of organisations, of which the SWP, the Socialist Workers' Party, I think was the most important. So in general, um, I have remained uh, you know, politically active as far as I can be on the left, and uh, that is true of my writing as well as my activity. Of those that left at the same time as you, Edward Thompson was for quite a long time in the Labour Party, though he, he yes. left a few years back. Royden Harrison, I think, is still in the Labour Party and at one stage stood for the National Executive. Um, a number of others have, have been in the Labour Party. A few went to the SLL. Why did you personally choose not to join the Labour Party? Um, I suppose uh, it goes back to my attitudes in the 1930s and my general view uh, since then, uh, of the history of the Labour Party, uh, that um, 
this is not a socialist organization, um, is not an agency for socialism. It obviously has some extremely good, lively, sincere, devoted people in it. I always vote Labour naturally. I give money to it uh, at the time of the election. People like uh, uh, John Prescott were my former students, and I, uh, I'm very fond of him. But by and large, I don't think I could uh, feel at all happy in an organisation like the Labour Party, which I think has many sins attached uh, to it. And I've now just finished a first volume of the uh, foreign policy of the Labour government of 1945, and it is, in my view, an horrendous story. So, the Labour Party is not for me. Uh, I think it's too tainted. Um, I think it has too many um, stains upon its political character which is not being prepared uh, to uh, uh, make evident or to come clean about. Looking back on 22 years in the CPGB, how do you view that now? With, with nostalgia, with pride, with a certain element of shame? How? Element of shame? Certainly not. Uh, nostalgia? No. I mean, one doesn't, uh, in politics, have nostalgia. I mean, that's a sentimental uh, uh, view of life. Uh, I regard it as an extraordinarily uh, uh, lively and important period for me. After all, I was uh, mixing uh, with some of the liveliest intellectuals. They were not, they were not the only lively intellectuals. There were plenty of intellectuals who were lively outside the Communist Party, but inside they were devoted socialists. They were lively intellectual uh, people who cared, who cared for, you know, the future of society. So I regard my communist years as uh, extremely important uh, to me. And I'm only sorry that the Communist Party could not, in fact, uh, bring itself to reform itself in ways uh, uh, which I could, uh, which ways I could accept. Um, and I should be very happy today to be a member of a left-wing organisation that was that was sincerely principled. And I don't see one around. When I've asked former members of the CPGB whether they feel any sense of shame. Most say, well, I feel very uncomfortable with some things I've done in my past. On the whole, no, shame is not the dominant emotion, but certainly there's a little bit of it there. You're very forthright in saying, certainly not, no shame. Oh, absolutely not. No shadow? No, of course not. I mean, I know, I know too much about the foreign policy, for example, uh, of the Labour government from 1945. Um, and I went through, I mean, uh, things, uh, uh, periods and episodes and events like Mau Mau in Kenya, like Cyprus, like Aden, I mean, the dying um, um, lights of uh, the empire. And it was monstrous uh, what we did. And this was our country. This has nothing to do with Russia. This is our country. And uh, we were against it. Now, of course, in politics, I, as I am quite aware, you, you cannot have a Simon Pure organisation. Uh, politics isn't like that. You have to make choices. But uh, uh, I am quite sure in my own mind, I hope this doesn't sound impossibly arrogant um, and, co or, and or complacent, because it's not, but I'm quite sure that while, of course, I defended things that were indefensible, of that I am, of course, absolutely certain, of which, as I have told you, anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union was the most important, because I actually stood up and said there wasn't any. The labour camps I knew about, but anti-Semitism I said there wasn't any, because I was convinced by my Jewish comrades that there wasn't. But for the rest, uh, of course, um, Given the fact that there were indefensible things, the, 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 as it were, the bulk of the majority opinions for which I stood were those which I would stand today. And these were simply a, a, a better life for working class people in general, a decent, humane uh, society and a foreign policy where you don't screw uh, other people's. Thank you. Just so I've got it on tape, um, do you have any 